Today you shall know your true identity. <laughs> Hallelujah. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.16, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So Jesus, by his grace, has removed all of your sins by what he did on the cross, by this great sacrifice he made. He's removed all your sins. When you give your life to him, what happens in the spiritual realm is your old self, your life as a sinner, where you were a sinner, your life where you were evil, where you didn't have a good heart, that is dead. It dies. It is crucified with Christ. When Jesus went into the ground, into the grave, when you give your life to Jesus, you have gone in there with Jesus in the grave. The old you is completely gone. The old you, how you identified yourself, it is gone. Your sinful nature, your tendency to sin, your tendency to think evil things and want to do evil things, it's dead, it's gone. Amen. And as Jesus rose from the grave, you have risen with him as a new creation. It says the old has gone. The new has come. You have become new, a new creation when you give your life to Jesus with a new identity. Your old identity is 100% gone. 100% gone. You have a new identity. And today you shall know your identity because many of you have never even learned what actually your identity in Christ is. Many of you have taken part of your old identity with you. But it's all gone. You need to know what your new identity is, and you need to allow God to transform you into how he wants you to be completely, to be identified as. Amen? Thank you, Lord. So number one, you, your identity is that you are new. You are a new creation, and the past is gone completely. The past you is gone. Number two, it says in John 1.11, but to all who, had, who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Number two, you are a child of God. That's your true identity. Your true identity is not you are a child of John and Susie, whoever your parents are. Your true identity is you are a child of God. So that means that you are, that you have a father, no matter if you have a physical father or not, because your true identity is you are a child of God. If you were born without, if you were, if you were adopted, if you, if your parents on earth rejected you, it doesn't make you less of a, a less belonging to, to, to someone, less of a child. Because your true identity is that you are a child of God. That's your true identity. The, the earthly parents, that's an earthly, earthly thing. But your eternal identity, your most true identity is that you are a child of God. He's your true father. He's not a stranger. He's not someone that you need to feel um, afraid of. He's your father. You're his child. And he loves you so much. The way a parent loves their child, but a billion, gazillion, not even a number for it, more that we can't even comprehend. That's how much he loves you. He loves you as if you are his only child in the whole world. That's how big his love is for you. That's how much you belong, truly belong to him. Amen. And it says, and it says, 
Romans 8, 17, and since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures, for indeed we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. So as a child, you need to know what that identity is. I mean, as a child, that means you have an inheritance. You have an inheritance from God. All that Jesus has, you have. Wow, that's a lot. You have all of heaven's resources. You have healing, freedom, abundant life in every area, abundance of peace, abundance of joy. This is your inheritance as a child of God. You are rich. You are wealthy. You're the most wealthiest in the in person in the entire world. We are. We are the most wealthy. The true riches. And we should walk like that. I'm a child of God. I have an inheritance from God. I have all of heaven. Heaven's resources. I have abundant life. There's nothing I could want for. There's nothing I lack. I have everything. Because I know who I am. I'm a child of God. You know how people on earth act when they are children of, like, very wealthy people or very important people? You know how they act? They have a swag, right? We got to have a swag about us, right? <laughs> We know who we are. We know what we have. We're not poor beggars. We are children of God. There's no greater inheritance than anyone can have on this earth than what we have. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. We are new. We are children of God. And number three, we are pure. We are the righteousness of God. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Righteousness of God, the definitions, if you look it up, I mean, right, righteousness means pure, purity of heart, the quality, a state of being morally correct and justifiable, upright. God, because he's made us new and because he's washed all of our sins away and our old sinful self is gone completely, because of that, this is how he can call us righteousness of God. This is how he can call us pure. Because we are new. We are made in his image. The real us that he sees in the spiritual realm is the righteousness of God, is pure. The Bible says that we are no longer slaves to sin. It says, Romans 6, 6, for we know that we, our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we would no longer be slaves to sin. So it's not right to say we're sinners, we're all sinners. We're not that anymore. That's not our identity. When we say we're sinners, that's saying that that's your identity. That's saying, that's literally saying that you're living your life continually sinning. <laughs> Nuh-uh. We have Holy Spirit in us, and he is transforming us into his image. This is the meaning of we are no longer slaves to sin. We were sinners before because we were slaves to sin. It was controlling us. We were in bondage before. We had demons controlling us before. But now, through the inheritance of Christ that he provides in this newness that he's made us, we are no longer slaves to sin. No longer slaves. We are no longer sinners. That's not our identity anymore. So this is how he really sees us as righteousness, pure, no longer a slave. You have to see yourself this way or you'll continue to live in your past identity, living a lie and not be able to transform into how, who God wants you to be. It says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, this is the Passion Translation, we can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces and with no veil we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into his very image, into his very image, as we move from one brighter level of glory to another, glory to glory. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So we are a new creation. Yes, we need work. We don't become looking exactly like Jesus from day one, but our spirit is pure. Our soul needs work, but our spirit is pure. And that's the real you, is your spirit. Not your soul, not your flesh, your spirit. So that's why God looks at you and says, you're pure, you're the righteousness of God. This is who you really are. You need to see yourself that way. You need to not see yourself as, this, as the parts of you that need work, the soul. 
you need to see yourself. I'm the righteousness of God. I'm pure. And this is, I want what my spirit is to be all of me. I want to be transformed completely into the image of God. Not just my spirit would look like him, but my soul, my feelings, my mind, my will would be, would look, would sound like Jesus. And it would translate to my body, my actions, everything would follow. This is what, but you have, but, but it, you can't get there by being like, oh, I'm a sinner, I keep messing up. You have to know who you are. I'm, God sees me as pure. He sees me as the righteousness of God. Lord, I, I want so badly to be completely like you, Lord, help me. And as you look to him, because you're seeing him rightly, that he's not condemning you, but he's seeing you with love. He's seeing you as pure righteousness. He loves you as you see him in that way. That's how you're able to be transformed. It says when we're looking at him, when, as we look to him, as we look to him, not turn away from him because we're condemning ourselves, because we're thinking he's condemning us, but we're looking to him. That's how we are transformed. So we, we have to live in this truth to be able to be transformed, to be able to look at him, to be transformed. So our soul is transformed. So our body is transformed. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So no longer getting down on yourself for the work that still needs to be done. No longer calling yourself a, a mess up, a loser, a, um, a sinner. But, but seeing yourself how God sees you, pure, righteousness, and I am being transformed. You have the Holy Spirit to help you, and he is enough. He is enough. Don't try to, when you look at your own strength, you can't do it. But you have him to help you. So have that faith. I'm being transformed into God's images. Absolutely I am. Because the Lord is helping me. It's all God doing it with my obedience. Amen. Okay, next we have part of your identity is that we are royal. We are royalty. You are royalty. It says in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. We don't even need the scripture to know we are royal, actually, because guess who our father is? The king. The king of kings. The king of kings is your father. So what does that make you? Royalty. Princes, princesses, queens, kings. But the, he's the king of kings. But you, you are the child of the king. You are royalty. Real royalty. More real royalty. A higher, higher, much higher royalty than the queens and kings in this world. There are true kings in this world. Like in England, there's a king. You are more royalty than that. Way more in the spiritual realm, which is more real than the physical. Amen? Once again, when royalty, royalty on earth, they know who they are. They walk with a swagger, right? We got to walk like royalty. We got to know who we are. I don't mean just physically walk, but that it just translates to that. Because when what you think as a ma man or woman thinks, so they are. So you think, mm, I'm nothing. I'm not worth anything. And you start to walk like this. So it does even translate physical. You need to start thinking who you are. I'm royalty. I really am royalty. My father's the king of kings, and I'm his daughter. I'm royalty. We can walk with our head up high, shoulders back, with confidence, <laughs> knowing how worthy we are. Knowing how chosen it says you are chosen people. We are chosen. I am chosen. So these are the these are the big parts of your identity. You are you are new. Meaning you are spiritual. The past you physical. Your old identity was super physical. The way the world identifies one another. You were doing it the world's way. You were identifying yourself the world's way. Now you are new. Your new identity is spiritual, not physical. Not the world's way of identity. You're a new creation. You are a child of God. You are pure. You are the righteousness of God. You are being transformed into his image to look like Jesus on this earth. Hallelujah. And you are royalty. That's 
That's a powerful identity, huh? Amen? Isn't that a powerful identity? I don't think we need any other parts to our identity. I think that's pretty good. Don't you think so? Not pretty good. This is the truth. This is what I want to tell you. This is your identity. You're a new creation. You're a child of God. You are pure, the righteousness of God. You're being transformed into his image. So you're in the image of God. And your loyalty. This is your identity. You don't need other things to identify you. The world has its way of identifying themselves. Some of you have been identifying yourselves the world's way. You have to get rid of that old identities because it's holding you back. Some of you it's holding you back. Some of you it's keeping you from walking in the calling that God has for you. Some of you it's actually keeping you in bondage. Some of you it's keeping you from glorifying Jesus with your life. It's a very serious deal. I have a serious message today. Serious message today. We are getting rid of our old identities today. So I want you to know what I just shared, to shared today. Get this in you. Take notes. This is recorded on live so you can go back, write the notes, get it in you. This is who you are. This is your identity, not other things. From there, once this is our main identity that every single one of us has as children of God. Now, from there, there are other parts that God can add. But these are the core parts of every one of our identities, from babies to elderly, male, female, this is our identity. Then God can add more on our identity. Now, God also created men and women, male and female. He distinctly made two different sexes, and he made them um, part of the reason to populate the earth. He says to Adam and Eve to go and populate the earth, be fruitful and multiply. Right now, Paul says, you know, some some people have a calling to be single on this earth, for according to God's calling. But many, God wants people to marry. It's God's will for them to be married and to populate the earth. Hallelujah. So God's created men. God's created female. And so he's made men to be men and female to be female. He's made men to be masculine, female to be feminine. And so when he's made us, as he's made us, we also need to be sensitive to the Lord with how he wants us to represent ourselves and present ourselves as men and as women. Amen? Amen. Also, there can be um, callings. There will be callings that you may have in your life. Like, for example, me, I'm an apostle. That's a, that's a calling I know God has given me for sure. There's no question. There's no doubt. It's my purpose here on this earth. And so that's a part of my identity now that was added by God is I'm an apostle. Hallelujah. So there's, there's these other parts that will be added onto your identity. But that's it. What I just mentioned. And, of course, you'll be mother. You'll be father. That's part of your identity too. You have children. Spiritual mom, spiritual father. But this is it. The world has a million other identities going on. And this is what we're going to talk about today. To get rid of all these other identities that the world has put on you or you have put on yourself because we've been living in the world and we go like the world many times without being spiritually minded. So what I just shared with you, this is your identity. Not your wealth status. Not your skin color. Not where you come from, where you are born, where you live. Not what other people call you. Not the clothes you like to wear, the fashion style you have. None of that is your identity. Your identity is you are a child of God. You are royalty. You are pure righteousness of God. You are a new creation. Hallelujah. Okay, but the world's way, the world's way, like in the world. The world has their way of identifying, of putting identities on people, on themselves. And this is, looks like this. People will identify themselves based on their preferences, their desires, 
their giftings, their talents, in which ways that they are unique. Um, They will identify themselves because they want to fit in somewhere to a certain people group, to belong, to feel like they can belong somewhere and be accepted and be understood. They identify themselves a certain way to feel confident. And they identify themselves based on their feelings. Did you catch that? So this is the world's way that we need to get rid of, off of ourselves. Now, what I just named, it's, it's all these things I just mentioned, is based on feeling. It's g- the way you're identified many times usually is based on feeling. Um, but what, what I shared in the beginning right now, what I've been sharing with what your true identity in Christ is, is not is any of that based on feeling? None of that's based on feeling at all. <laughs> it's based on the truth which comes from the word of God. It's based on the spiritual truth that we believe in. So we say, yes, Lord. I know a lot of us don't feel like royalty. <laughs> Doesn't matter we don't feel like royalty. We say, this is my identity because this is what God says. Right? Many of us feel like sinners. We don't feel pure. We don't feel like the righteousness of God. doesn't matter what you feel. It matters what God says. So you say, I am the righteousness of God. I am pure. Hallelujah. So this is the world's way. Some of you might have created your own identity yourselves. Like created your, let me give you an example. This is very common in the world's way. We, like people in this world, we always feel like we, wanna f- we want to find what our calling is, and we want to shine in that area, and we want to excel there, and we want to be confident. We don't want to be wish-washy. We want to be able to tell people, like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. This is who I am. These are my plans. I'm going places. You know, <laughs> this is, like, how it is in the world. Um, and so there's actually this pressure for you to really – find your identity and be insecure in that. And so when you don't know what I just shared with you, the truth, if you're not in Christ or if you are in Christ and you don't know what I just shared with you, you're going to be trying to make your own identity because of pressure for the world and because it makes you feel good, makes you feel secure, makes you feel confident. Um, And so let me give you an example for myself. Um, I grew up um, in, in middle school and high school, I remember that I, I did really well in school. I was like, got good grades in, in everything, in every area. And I was just like, I was like good at a lot of things, but I, I didn't, I actually, I didn't really enjoy school. There wasn't one class that I just, um, like loved. And I remember feeling like, man, I really wish I really loved something. What am I going to even go to college for? You know, uh, I remember feeling that like pressure. And then once it was time to apply for college, I had to really think about it. I was like, I don't know what to do. The only really big passion I had was was singing, was musical theater. And so I remember going to college, okay, let me look look for, look for that and and I remember it was like a 3% acceptance rate that people would they would audition and get in. So I was like, "Oh, maybe I won't do that." And so I remember just trying to find something and I remember I ended up going for communications, but I didn't really know. I was thinking maybe event planning. I was trying to find something. I was trying to find what career I should do. And um, then I went to school for communications, and and, um, I really missed singing. And so midway through college, I I became a music minor, started taking voice lessons. And then um, I graduated, and I was once again like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what God wants me to do with my life. And I was praying, and at this point, I wasn't surrendered to God yet, but I loved him, and I did want his will. This is before I encountered the power of God, because with the power of God that opened up my eyes to God's love, it led me to be able to surrender to him. So here I was, age 22, and long story short, I felt God leading me to move to L.A. to pursue acting. So I came out here. Um, with no family here, two acquaintances, and I was pursuing acting. Then I, I, as I got closer to God, once I arrived here, um, my heart was, was beating more to do something purposeful that really was something that would really lead p- 
people to him. And so long story short, I, I, I once again realized, you know what, I think singing really is my biggest passion. So I ended up pursu- starting to pursue Christian pop EDM music to be, I wanted all of a sudden now I had found, okay, I'm going to be a singer songwriter, pop EDM singer songwriter, Christian. And um, it was such a long journey from, from high school to, I mean, I went to school for communication thinking I was going to be an event planner. Then I graduated and I thought I was going to be a wedding, oh, I, tr- I was a wedding planner internship I had one time. Um, and then I graduated. I was working at a restaurant. I came out here. I was going to be an actor. And now this music. And I, and I thought, finally, I had reached it. This is what I was the most passionate about yet, what I was the most excited about. And things were going really well. I released singles and music videos, and they went really well. Like, the production of it was just amazing. And so many of my family and friends were saying, like, wow, it's so amazing what you're doing. You're going to make it. I was getting, like, encouragement and support from acquaintances, family, and friends, like I never had in my life before. And so I'm like, finally, I found it. And I thought for sure this was God's calling for my life. Um, And I noticed that I started to identify myself as this, you know, I'm a singer, I'm a Christian singer, this is who I am, I'm a Christian singer, like this is my identity, right? And then one day, I encountered the power of God, my eyes opened up to God's amazing love, I surrendered everything, and I said, Lord, you can have my entire life for the first time, I give you everything, I give you my dreams, my plans, my will, I give you even my singing dreams, everything, I give them to you, and you can change them completely, my plans. If you want, you can. I did that. Nine months later, God did that, just that. <laughs> and nine months later, I went to a conference. A prophet was ministering there. He ends up prophesying to me and says that I'm actually called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm called to reach the nations, and God will do many miracles through me. And so I received that word, and I remember just being like, what? But I'm a singer. What? An apostle? what? I'm a singer. Like that identity was in me of a singer. And that now this, this new part of identity that God wanted to give me was, I did not feel it at all. That was not me. I'm not a preacher. Public speaking was my biggest fear and weakness. And I had no desire to preach. I would watch preachers. I love listening to preachers, but not one time was I like, I wonder if I could do that. Or maybe because I love God so much, maybe I should preach. Never did I think that. Not one time. I didn't have a dream of it. Nothing. Okay. And, but I'm hearing this. But I, in this moment, though, it was, God, it was God's voice saying, this is who I've called you to be. And I didn't feel it. There were zero feelings. I feel an apostle in this moment. Zero feelings. It was completely God saying, this is who I've called you to be. And in the world's way, your identity is so much based on feelings. So it's so opposite the world's way. And the world's way, this topic of identity, we don't tend to think that it's super worldly. We tend to think it's just normal, the way that we identify ourselves in this world. Like there are so many Christians who are identifying themselves in the worldly way just because they don't, it doesn't feel like it's a sinful thing. But it's really worldly. It's not spiritual. So I accepted the call to be an apostle because I just wanted to obey God. I just wanted to be in his will more than anything. And I, and thank God I, I knew the word of God enough to know, like, this is how he is. This is what he did with Mary. This is what he did with Moses. He just says, do this for me. People have their own plans. They're like, okay, I'll obey you. I didn't see this coming, but I'll obey you. So I, thank God I knew the word of God. God reminded me of Moses, and I said, yes, Lord, okay. I don't know how this is going to happen. And I remember feeling so uncomfortable um, when I accepted that call. And the months later, I remember, like, you're an apostle. And it felt weird. I'm like, it doesn't feel like me. Like, I feel like a singer. And I remember I was sharing my testimony on social media. And all of that support I had from all my friends and family and acquaintances, it vanished, like, pretty much completely. And I could tell everyone thought I was weird. And I could tell everyone was like, what in the world? Has she gone crazy? Like, she's a singer. Like, she's really talented at that. Like, her music videos, her singles she's put out, they're really good. Like, she's not a preacher. I never heard her speak one time. But she's gifted at singing, so this doesn't make sense. Is she crazy? Like, I pretty, I'm pretty sure people didn't really say that outright, but I'm pretty positive. Like, a lot of people felt that way about me, like, that knew me. They themselves had already put an identity on me. She's a singer. That's her biggest gift. She's a singer. That's who she is. Preacher? Apostle? 
but this was God's true identity for me. And me, myself, I didn't, now I'm in this uncomfortable place. I'm like, I felt confident, and I enjoyed singing. And now I'm over here, like, receiving God's call, and, like, this is before even the church started, but in that, mo- in that time of first receiving the call and before the church started, and even when I started preaching and we started having services, I did not feel like an apostle. I felt like a singer. I didn't feel like an apostle. I didn't feel like it at all. But it was my true identity, part of my true identity. But, like, this word I'm sharing with you is so important because the world's way is like what feels right is the right way. What do you feel happy? That's what you should do. You love to sing the most? Then that's definitely what you're supposed to do. Okay, try this out, what you feel God is calling you to do, to be an apostle, to preach. Try it out. How do you feel? If I was that way, I would not be here right now. I've been gone a few months ago, uh, a few years ago from preaching because I didn't feel like an apostle for a long time. I didn't feel like an apostle for probably years, probably not until about when the revival started breaking out, I didn't, which was like a year and a half ago, probably for three to four years, I didn't feel like an apostle. But it doesn't matter what I felt. I remember, like, pretty early on, God wanted me to change my my name on, like, Instagram. I was, like, at Catherine Crick, and I God wanted me to change that at Apostle Catherine Crick. I remember I felt, oh, that was so uncomfortable. I felt so weird doing that. I felt, because it didn't feel like me. It felt like a lie or something. You know, I felt like, it doesn't feel like me. But it's, I had to believe this is what God, this is who God says I am. So this is who I am. It doesn't matter how I feel. And so this is how it is with God, with, with everything with God, with your identity. God wants to put passions and desires in you. God wants to, to mold your heart and give you his desires. There's so many of you that, that have yet to receive even desires that God wants to give you. Like for his people, for example. Like the passion that God has for his children. God wants to put that in you even much stronger than you have now. There's, there's different passions that God wants to birth, to put in you. But it doesn't happen with you just sitting around and waiting for it. It happens with you accepting what God has called you to, accepting his desires, accepting his will, accepting his identity over you, and choosing to walk in that way. Choosing to walk in obedience in that way. So, like, I would show up to preach for so many weeks, and I wasn't like, oh, I'm so excited to preach, and people are going to be touched by the word, and I'm so excited about how people are going to be blessed by the word. I didn't feel that way. I felt, I don't really want to do this. (laughs) For a long time. (laughs) But I would show up and just do it anyway. I would show up, and I would love people by showing up, by doing what God called me to do. I would spend time with God so he could give me a word for his people. That was me loving people. And I didn't feel it. I didn't feel like, oh, I'm so excited for them to receive this word, you know. But as I kept showing up, as I kept showing up, as I kept just walking in my identity without the feelings. Hi, I'm Apostle Catherine. I don't feel like it. Hi, I'm Apostle Catherine. And I'm doing the apostle things. I'm preaching. I'm praying for people. I don't feel like if I'm doing it, God called me to. As I kept showing up, this gave God permission to put his hands in my heart and mold my heart to put new desires, passions in me. He put, he put his passions and desires in me that then made me start to feel like an apostle that then made me start to feel so much love for his people, that then started to make me feel like, wow, I have this revelation that that if I can step out, if I can speak a word of God, it's going to bless people and touch people. If I can pray for people, God can move through me and heal them and deliver them. I want them to be healed. I want them to be delivered. This heart, this passion started to come in me over time, not immediately, not overnight, over time. So now, today, here I am, and it's been um, like six years, six years later, after I was first given that 
new part of my identity as apostle. And I can tell you, I feel like an apostle. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I feel like my identity. And, and the, the, the things that God calls me to do as an apostle, to preach, to heal the sick, to cast out the demons, to, to sacrifice, to surrender, to, to surrender my life, to work hard for him, all these things, I feel like doing it. I mean, not always, of course, we're, you know, it's not all about feelings, but by and large, I feel this is my identity. You know, this is, it's a, an amazing transformation that God has done in me when it comes to my identity. But it didn't happen with a blink of an eye. I didn't wake up one day and be like, oh, I feel like an apostle. <laughs> it did not happen like that. It happened with me surrendering everything. S me surrendering my identity of a singer. My passions of a singer. And I can tell you now that God has, I, I still love to sing. And I'm so grateful God has me singing and still for in the worship time. And creating music sometimes still. We have 5F worship, but truly, I'm more passionate now preaching, healing the sick, casting out demons, doing the work of an apostle. I'm truly more passionate doing that. But it's a supernatural thing that had taken place by me surrendering to God, by me giving up my desires, my preferences, my opinions, my identity, my past identity. So there's some of you that you've created your own identity. Like, I created my own identity. Even with the music, I remember, as I told you, I remember being like, I wish that, like, I was just, I just wanted to be a doctor. Like, and I'm so good at math and science. Like, I remember thinking, like, I wish that was me. You know, I was all over the place. I, I didn't really have this one big passion. But it actually it was God, so it was beautiful. It was like... I wasn't surrendered yet, but that was there. I remember coming out here to do acting. I remember being in the acting classes, and everyone was so much more passionate about acting than me, and it bothered me. I'm like, I guess maybe this is, isn't my calling. Or I don't know what's wrong with me. So then I went for the music, but still it seemed like other people were more passionate about the songwriting and everything. So I remember, I, I remember even kind of like trying to make myself be more passionate about music, trying to like make this identity come on me more. I remember once I found it, like, yes, I think finally I found my calling. I remember, like, purposely, you know, putting my eyes to it more, get, trying to make myself more passionate about it. What I'm trying to tell you is that we, in this world, we tend to, like, create our own identities. That are not, like, singing is not a bad thing. It's not some evil thing. It was Christian singing. It's not some evil thing, but it wasn't from God. That identity I put on myself was not from God. It was me conjuring it up in my own because I thought I need to figure out what I'm going to do. I want to be successful, I, you know, I and I want to I want to make a difference in the world. I want to reach people, be a vessel of God through what I'm doing. So I got to find something. Let's, f you know. Amen. Does anyone relate? Yeah. This is the world's way. So we have to be really aware with what we've done in our own identity, how we put it on ourselves. So number one, the world's way of making your identity on, on yourself is creating your own identity, like the example I just gave you of my life. But then secondly, another way that the world has identities is based on the devil's influence. The devil, I'm telling you, is out there to shape people's identity so that it would not glorify God so that people wouldn't receive freedom and healing and walk an abundant life. So that he can get them to go his way and bring him glory. That's what the devil's after. The devil is sneaky, and he is out to mold people's identities. So we have to be very aware that we are not of the world at all. We are not adopting the devil's influence over our identity. And I'm going to share some examples with you of how this can happen. There is so much power in words. There's so much power in words. And in society, there are stereotypes. A certain skin color is a certain way, behaves a certain way, or has a certain income level, for example. If someone has a certain fashion style or a certain career, they're automatically gay or something. You know? There, the society has these groupings. They said, if you are like this, this makes you this. 
This is from the devil. This is the devil trying to shape people's identities to not be of Christ, but how he wants them to be. It's a sneaky way he's, he's infiltrated society. And so let me give you an example of this. People who identify as homosexual, and once again, here you, you hear the word identify. This is all over our society. What do you identify as? A child of God. What do you mean, you know? It's all over society. What do you identify as, you know? So even that's wrong, you know? It should be child of God, not all these other things. But people who identify homosexual, I've heard many, many stories. It seems like even most, I'm not sure the exact, I'm, I, who knows the exact percentage, but it seems like most, they have a s very similar to story, similar testimony of an abuse or a, a sexual abuse or molestation happening when they were young, when they were a child. What's happening there is, is when an abuse, when a molestation happens, we know that's an open door for, for the devil, right? So what happens is the devil knows what has happened, and the devil strategically can speak things to that child, even and uh, sexual things. There's been people who've come here that have said that they've renounced sexual desires and thoughts they've had since a very young child. That's demonic. That's the devil coming sneakily in and speaking. Those, those thoughts and desires they had were not themselves. It was the devil coming in their mind, inserting those things that they thought were their own thoughts and desires. So there are some children who had these desires that felt very natural, but they weren't, like, natural. They were coming from the enemy in the mind through the thoughts. Speaking, you should like the same sex, that find that attractive. In different ways, the devil will try to mold identities in that way. Uh, in different ways, such as, like, you know, God didn't give every man the same tone of voice. You know what I mean? Like, all men do not need to have a very low voice. But society has shaped it this way that if a man has a little bit higher than voice than what they consider normal, that they're homosexual. That's the devil. And also, who says that if a man has a talent of, like, cutting hair or something, that makes them homosexual? It's the devil. But there's so much. I'm just giving you a couple examples here. But what happens is the devil has, has put this in society, that if a person is like this, they must be this. And so, therefore, even young children start speaking these words over people. You're gay. You're homosexual. They speak these words over them. And you know there's power in the tongue. If that's spoken over you tons of times as a child, the child's going to think this must be true. And at the same time, the devil knows what's being spoken, so he strategically puts thoughts and desires in the mind, in the heart and the mind. This is how it happens. All having to do with the devil influencing identity through people's words, through how society is, and through children and adults not knowing how the devil comes sneakily through the thoughts. Your thoughts are not all your own. So many of your thoughts and desires are sent from the devil. It's not your original thought, your original desire. Uh-uh. Amen? But when you accept them as your natural thoughts and desires, when you accept the words spoken over you, you are allowing the devil to form this identity over you where it really, I mean, fully feels like you, completely like you. So this is what we have going on in the world today. The devil influencing people with their identities, not knowing what's really going on, thinking that it was just naturally, it's just how I'm born. It's just how I was created. I've been this way since I was a child. Well, the enemy's been working. There could be generational curses. Is why he was able to speak such things or open doors happen at a young age. You know, I even had this question. I did a Q&A uh, a few days ago on the live, and I, and, and I was asking questions. People had spiritual questions, and somebody asked this. They said, I'm autistic, and I'm afraid I'll lose part of my identity. And what, that, what I think they meant by that is that once again, there's a stereotype, I've heard this, that people with autism have been like genius or genius or geniuses, like I think maybe Mozart or something, I don't know, I forget who, but 
people in the past have been like very smart and been autistic and everything. So the world says that if you have autism, you are very gifted. So it's actually a blessing. And the world says the inability to socialize correctly and problems in the mind, that's actually okay. It's just different. It's not different. It's demonic. It's not abundant life. And Jesus wants to free his children of issues in the mind, of inability to focus and think straight and speak. God wants to free his people of that. But look how demonic it is. Look how the devil has come so that people would accept bondage, calling it beautiful. The genius, the giftings is from God. The autism, the spirit behind it, the inability to think straight, focus problems in the mind, that's not from God. It's sickness, it's demonic, and Jesus wants to free his children from that. And Jesus is doing that now. Jesus has been delivering so many children from autism. There's been like five or six or seven testimonies of children being healed, being so transformed within like a month or so. There's been, they just keep coming. And faith is building. Faith is growing. Hallelujah. You can read those testimonies later after service. It's on my story. I just put it up. But it shocked me what I put on my story. I wanted to read it to you right now because it shocked me. It amazed me of Jesus of how powerful he is because so I shared this video testimony of this woman last Sunday testifying about how her, her son's been healed and been transformed so much ever since joining the Zoom Live of autism. And then um, as soon as I posted the video, like immediately there's a woman who commented and she said, I went to Myrtle Beach, Revival is Now, which was like a few weeks ago. And I brought my, I drove like six or seven or eight hours and I drove my, I brought my son who had autism and the pastor got him prayed for him. And he's transformed. I forget if, if he was saying words now or what, but he's been, there's, there's transformation that's happened in his life. Hallelujah. And then, and then another person immediately commented on her comment and said, Apostle Catherine, she prayed for my son and he was not speaking at all. He was just saying sounds and now he's speaking words. And the, the speech therapist is saying it's like his mouth is being awoken, is awakening now. Hallelujah, look at our Jesus. Hallelujah. He's healing children of, with autism and so, so these things, whether it's autism, whether it's any kind of mental illness, whether it's any kind of other sickness where people have said they're just different, they're just different. It's important we don't call what's bondage just different. It's important we see it for what it is and we see God wants to get rid of that. God wants more for you. Amen. God wants to heal you and deliver you and you get to keep your gifting. You get to keep your genius. Your, your, your intellectual smartness, you get to keep that because that's from God. They don't come together. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then the last example I want to give to you about how society shape. This is all society is doing, the devil coming through society. The last example I want to give you is um, like maybe certain, a certain maybe nations or even it could be areas of the city. It could be areas of L.A., so, certain geographic location um, sometimes can speak over you if it's a if it's a like a impoverished nation if it's a third world country. There is this identity many times in, of society placed over you that you are poor that you will remain poor. This is your life. And so, like example, let's say you're in a third world nation. And everyone around you is like this dressed a certain way, you know, and, and it has that attitude of like, we're not going to go further than this. Our whole past generations have been in poverty. We're going to be in poverty too. And then people don't even like try. People don't even have hope. You can even see it in different nations like America. America here, there is a, in general, there is a place where there is hope, where you can come from nothing and become something great, Right? That's all over the nation, and so it's kind of infiltrated society. It's infiltrated. You, you see it with, like, small businesses. You see it with customer service. Like, there's a standard, like, customer service. They treat you well. They smile here in America. They treat you well. It's because people here, they want to work hard. 
they believe that if they work hard and they work with excellence, that they will go farther. They have hope, they believe, and so therefore they work hard. They're, they're living in that, like, identity, right? If you go to other countries, though, like, I've been to some countries, some countries in, in, in for example, Africa, it's, it, you, can, you can literally feel that identity that is put over them. You can feel, like, some people not, like, putting forth the effort. You can feel that there's not, like, this hope. There's not this expectancy and zeal. You know, and so this is what society's put over them. So this, in terms of poverty, we cannot be, we cannot accept this. We cannot accept this. If your past generations have been poor, you can't, you can't walk in that identity. Your royalty. <laughs> Greater is he that is in you than, than anything in this world, than any circumstance. So if you are surrounded by all these impossible situations, if you have generations and generations behind you of poverty and, and you've been stuck in poverty, you've been in debt, and you don't even see hope around you, greater is he that is in you than all of the obstacles, than all of what looks impossible around you. Nothing is impossible when you know who you are. Nothing is impossible when you know who you are. Walk in that. I can do anything through Christ. I am not poor. I am royalty. I will not be stuck in poverty. I am royalty of God, and I will. I have an, an inheritance from God as a child of God, and that is abundant life. So these are just a couple examples I've given you right now of how the devil specifically has come through society to try to identify you in hopes that you would identify you. And you, you see, when you accept all these things, you are missing out on God's abundant life. You are stuck in bondage, and God is not getting the glory. Okay, so now what we need to do. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and that you are not your own property? You are not your own property. You are not your own. You are not your own. You belong to God. Your temple is the Holy Spirit. So what you need to do, if you want to be surrendered to God, if you want his identity, how he wants to be over you, you need to surrender everything, which includes the things you've held on to as your identity, your preferences, your opinions, your desires, your likes, your passions, things that make you happy, simple joys of life. Everything you need to surrender to God. If you want his perfect identity to be over you. As I shared with you before, I did not have this passion and desire to be an apostle before, but God put it supernaturally in me as I denied myself, as I laid down my passions that were not bad passions, but I laid them down. And I walked in obedience. Over time, God did the impossible and put these brand new passions inside of me. That's what God wants to do for many of you. There are some of you who have had um, homosexual um, desires, passions, preferences in all aspects of, of the word, um, even like even how you dress and everything. God wants to you to surrender that to him so he can birth completely new passions and desires in you that are his. Where you will re represent him how he wants to be represented in every aspect of the word represent. Physical, how you speak socially, every aspect of it. And that he, would even, he could even birth passions in you that you can never imagine having. Passions for the opposite sex. If you've never had passions for the opposite sex, God can do that. If God can put these passions that I had not at all in me, God can do the same thing for you. For any kind of passion that's out there, God can do it. 
And there's some of you that God has created, God, God has a plan for you to have a family, for you to have children, and to bring so much joy in your life. And the devil wants to, ro- want to rob you of that. that. You don't need to let the devil rob you of that anymore, but you have to surrender everything to God. And he will give you desires you couldn't imagine ever having that come from him, that bring you more joy, that bring you more joy than the life you had before. That's the trap that the devil's put upon people who, who are in homosexuality because they feel happy there. They feel themselves there. But what God has for them, the identity that God has for them, the plans he has for them, the passions and desires he wants to put in them are so much greater, will bring so much more happiness, peace, and joy. And that's the, that's the, that's the heart we need to have as, as um as people of God, that we want, that God wants more for his people, not that God wants to, to fix somebody or to change some, you know, God just wants more. God wants better. That's his heart, and that's the heart we should have. So we're not being judging, amen, because there's been so much judgment that's come. To people who identify as homosexual, they, they feel so judged, we need to come with this heart in the spiritual realm that God just wants more. He wants more. He wants better. And I want more for you because I know the abundant life God's given me and I want abundant life, what that looks like for you. Hallelujah. And so in terms of our identity, there's so many parts that go into our identity. And I want to talk even, it should translate from, from even into the physical realm, like even how we present ourselves. We, we should ask God, how do you want me to present myself, Lord? I can tell you what, he doesn't want you to look like you don't care. He, don't, he doesn't want you to look like a slob. Why? Because you represent him. We're called to be the light of the world. If I'm dressed in and walking like this, how am I being attractive for people to even want to talk to me? But if I look like I respect myself, if I look like I care, if I look like presentable, I'm not saying we have to spend tons of money on our clothes. I'm not saying that. Just put presentable. We become even a greater light for God. We're shining brighter. We're making people to, God uses anything to get people's attention. God God can use anything to get somebody to look at your eyes and see the light of Jesus shining through your eyes. Amen? So this is what I've done with God. I used to not dress how I dress now. But I really, I guess, God, Lord, I want to, I want to represent you perfectly. I want to represent you in a way that makes you proud. I want to look royal. You know, I want to, I want to represent, I want to wear what you want me to wear. And I've changed how I dressed. I was really intentional about it. Um, being more professional, I felt God say, I want you to be more professional. More professional. You know, you're my, my, my royalty. And also, we as, as children of God also need to redefine what the world, how the world sees the Christianity. Because the world sees Christianity as poor. But we're royalty. We're abundant life in every area. More than enough. We have more than enough that we are able to bless others, not be beggars. So in that regard, too, God spoke to me. I want you to represent yourself in that way. Amen. Hallelujah. So this is how you should be in every area of your life. Every, every passion, desire you have, passion for fashion, whatever, give it to God. How do you want me to present myself, Lord? And, and, this is, and, it's, and when we're men and we're women, we should be masculine if we're men. We should be feminine if we're women. Amen. And that might not feel natural. But we surrender it to God. Because we want to present, represent him the best way that pleases him the most. Hallelujah. What you need to do is to remove titles you've identified yourself with that are holding you back. Like homosexual, autistic, crippled, paralyzed, blind, deaf. Even if, you, even if you can't see or you're deaf, if you're constantly saying, I'm a blind person, I'm a blind person, you're not, you're not saying, Jesus can heal me. 
We're saying the opposite. We got to be careful with the words we're speaking over ourselves. Amen? So if you are out there, if you have autism, stop saying, I, I'm autistic. I'm autistic. So stop saying it. We have to shed our old identities if we want God to put his identity upon us, his true identity. Amen? We have to shed. So today we're going to renounce these things, the words you've spoken. Hallelujah. We have to shed these things, number one. Also, number two, you could be like me five years ago, thinking, yeah, this is what I'm called to do, be a singer. That might be you in your life today, but you might not be completely positive that God spoke that to you. You need to surrender that to God. I'm not saying turn away from that. I'm saying sur- give it to God. Surrender it to God. That's what I did. And when I did that, it literally gave God permission to redirect me. You need to give God permission to redirect you if he wants to redirect you. So you need to surrender that to him today. Some of you have really identified yourself as a certain thing without God saying, like, this is what I've called you to do. Surrender it to Jesus and say, Lord, I give this to you. If you want to redirect me, if you want me to do something that I can't even, wouldn't even enjoy at first, and I'll be like a pulse gathering like that, I, I, I'll do it, Lord. I surrender. I just want your perfect will, your perfect identity over me. Amen.